Hey everybody, this is So Heidi, and you're listening to the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast. We all know that the fashion industry is brutally competitive and it takes loads of hard work to get ahead. The problem is that everyone's secretive and tight lipped about their ways. After working as a designer and educator for over a decade, I wanted to help break down those barriers and bring you valuable knowledge from industry experts, and this show is exactly where you'll find that. Whether you're trying to break into the fashion world, make yourself more marketable, launch your own label, or become a successful freelancer, we'll help you get ahead in the cutthroat fashion industry. This is episode 68 of the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast, and today we have a mailbag episode where I answer listener questions. Today we're going to talk about preparing to apply for fashion school, what skills you need to learn besides Adobe Illustrator and Tech Packs, why you may be getting job interviews but aren't getting any offers, tips on working with your first freelance client, and vetting factories for your fashion brand. As always, if you have questions that you want answered on the podcast, email them to podcast at soheidi.com. I pick the best ones and answer them once a month. To access the show notes for today's episode, visit sfdnetwork.com slash 68. Now let's go right into the questions. The first question is from Mila. Mila emails and says, I want to study fashion design in college, but I'm afraid that I'm still not skilled enough to get in. I'm wondering if there's any way to build up my skill so I'm confident and capable of getting in. She also says, I'm in the process of getting a good stylist tool, and I want to ask if there's any good apps and programs for tablets for fashion design. All right, Mila, so this is kind of a two-part question. So let's start with the beginning how you can build up your confidence so you're capable of getting in. Here's what I would recommend. I would start with learning the basics of sewing and construction and just start making stuff. Now, I know that in the long run, and I talk about this a lot, you're not actually going to be sewing garments when you're working as a designer, but it's really important to understand the construction of garments and how things are put together. I've seen a lot of designers and I've heard stories about a lot of designers who air quotes, don't know how garments actually work and are constructed, and they design things that are impossible to actually create. There's no way for the person to get in or out of the design. There's no, you know, zippers or button closures or snap closures. And so on many levels, I do think it's important to have a general understanding of construction and sewing. You do not need to be an amazing seamstress. You do not need to be an amazing pattern drafter unless you're going into technical design, which is kind of a different different route. But I think having the general knowledge of sewing and construction and understanding how garments are assembled is really essential. The other thing I would tell you is don't worry about your first designs being perfect. Just start making stuff. Buy patterns from the fabric store and copy patterns. You know, watch videos on YouTube and learn the basics of sewing. Take a class at a vocational school. That's exactly what I did when I first got started. I started learning how to sew. My mom had taught me the very, very basics, basically how to just run the machine and and put thread through it. And then I took classes. I took some lessons with a woman I found here who had posted a a flyer on the on the cork board at my local fabric store at Joanne's Fabrics. I took some classes from her. I took classes at a vocational school. And I just started creating. I think there's something to be said for just getting your hands dirty and doing the work and kind of playing with fabric and designs and seeing what happens. Again, don't be too judgmental on yourself at the beginning because here's the thing. A lot of your first designs are going to be terrible and that is okay. I've done some recaps of my first designs as a designer and the first ones are horrendous but you know what's really interesting is that when I was making them I was having fun and I was learning and that was okay that was all that mattered so as I went through sort of my design career my design history when I was first starting out I could see a trajectory I could see what my designs looked the first year I was sewing versus the second year I was sewing versus the third year I was sewing. And there was a very clear trajectory of the improvements. So don't worry about them being perfect or amazing. Just get started. So learn the basics of construction. There's um, another really great 
thing you can do to learn construction, and this is something that I did a lot, is I took clothes apart. And so I would go buy things at the thrift store that I liked how they fit or they looked or the styling, and I would cut them apart to understand how they were put together. There's something really powerful about backwards engineering a garment for the learning curve. So that's where I would start in terms of getting comfortable and confident with your skills. I would also start sketching some ideas. And do this whatever way you feel comfortable. If this is on pen and paper, that's fine. Know that in the long run, you're not going to be doing fancy fashion illustrations, but you can start doing some loose sketches on pen and paper. If this is something you'd rather do on the computer, which ultimately you should graduate to doing, um, you know, start working in Adobe Illustrator. This kind of leads us to our next question, which is, You mentioned you're in the process of getting a good stylist tool and you want to ask if there's any good apps or programs for tablets for fashion design. I don't suggest doing design on a tablet or using an app for design. In the industry, we don't use... And I'm going to say tablets when I'm going to say things like an iPad or, you know, a specific app from like the iTunes app store. Um... Those are not the tools that you're going to actually use. You're going to be sketching in Adobe Illustrator. Now, can you sketch in Adobe Illustrator on a tablet? Yes, you can. Uh, The leading brand is Wacom, W-A-C-O-M. I'll link to that in the show notes. And you can learn to sketch on that. It ties directly into your computer. It doesn't work on a tablet as far as an iPad. Um, An iPad does not run Adobe Illustrator. You're going to need either a Wacom tablet as an extension of your computer, or you're going to need a uh, Windows Surface Pro is a great tool that I know a lot of designers use if you want to go the Windows route. Um, So I would focus on Illustrator. The other thing I'll, I'll just suggest as a global... Uh, sort of piece of advice is I think it's really easy for designers and aspiring designers to focus on finding the right tool and the right fancy app. There's a ton of sketching apps out there and a ton of different tools. But I think that some, there's something to be said about focusing on working within a small box. And that small box in the industry, if you genuinely want to work in the industry on a professional level, that small box is Adobe Illustrator. So don't get shiny object syndrome with all these tools and all these apps. Focus on Illustrator and how you sketch in there doesn't really matter. Whether you use a mouse, whether you use a tra- trackpad on your c- keyboard, which is often how I draw a lot. I know a lot of people think that's crazy. Uh, or a Wacom tool, it doesn't matter. Focus on learning Illustrator find the tool that works for you and go on from there. So Mila, I hope that answers your question and provides you with some insights. And please do keep me updated with your journey. I would love to hear how your journey progresses with your uh, application to fashion college. All right. Up next, we have Mary. And Mary's question is somewhat of an extension of Mila's. So the timing on this was perfect. Mary says, I want to know what are the other essential things one needs to know apart from illustration and tech packs, and what do you recommend will be of help to us? Lastly, when you started out, what did you learn first that put you in that different light? Well, Mary, as I said, this is kind of an extension of what I suggested for Mila, but there's a few other things that I would also advise. So again, definitely focus on learning the basics of construction. Um, look how garments are look at how garments are made in the market. So not just going to the thrift store and cutting things apart and learning about that. But when you're shopping, look at garments, look at the inside, open up the pockets, see how things are constructed, take a look at some of those details and really start paying attention to that. Because here's the thing, when you're doing illustrations in tech, in uh, flash and flat illustrations in Adobe Illustrator, and when you're creating tech packs, which are two of the skills you're going to be doing uh, as an entry level or an assistant designer and beyond, you're, you're going to continue to do those skills as you grow your career. You need to understand how to accurately spec and draw a garment, which means you need to understand how garments are put together and constructed. Now, you're never going to know every single detail. I won't lie that even, you know, a decade more into my career, I still have to look at reference garments to see, okay, well, how did they do this one part so that I can draw that accurately and I can communicate that to the factory? 
So I would first get started by, again, really paying attention to construction and design details. I like the idea of cutting garments apart, which I know can feel painful, but if you buy stuff from the thrift store um, that's, you know, inexpensive, this can be a great learning process. The reason I like this is because there's often construction details that you don't even know exist because they're inside certain parts of the garment, like inside the waistband. It's fascinating to look inside a waistband and see how that's put together. So again, I would focus on construction. The other thing I would focus on is understanding the basics of textiles and fabrics. Um, So first of all, you know, you've got your big global categories, which are knits versus wovens. Um, If you don't quite understand the difference of those, um, I definitely would do some Googling and understand what's the difference between a knit versus a woven. Those are your two big textile categories. From there, think about what market you're interested in. Is it active wear? Is it evening wear? Is it uh, outerwear? All of these different categories are going to have different fabrics that they kind of use an, as an ongoing basis. And I think that it's important to get yourself familiar with sort of a broad overview of some of those fabrics. Again, you may be able to find a textile class at a vocational school near you, um, or you may just kind of have to do some of this research on your own. You don't have to know every fabric under the sun uh, or every construction uh, detail under the sun. For example, I don't do sweater knits, and I know nothing about picking out yarns for sweaters. I just, I don't know anything about that. It's not my market. So don't feel overwhelmed that you have to know everything, but think about some of the general fabrics that are used in a category that you're interested in and get yourself up to speed with some of those. As far as the design perspective, some of the things that I would focus on is thinking about commercially viable designs and not conceptual or really artistic designs. One of the number one things I see from designers who are aspiring, whether they come out of fashion school or they're creating their own self-directed projects, is that the designs are very interesting and artistic and conceptual, and they're amazing. It's really fantastic stuff. It kind of leans towards stuff that you see on the runway, and you can watch runway shows and you can be inspired by high fashion, but here's the thing. Did you know that most of the designs you see on the runway at fashion shows do not actually go to market? Those designs are for marketing and publicity purposes. They're a show. They're to show off and to catch attention. And they're usually really, you know, conceptual and very artistic. But at the end of the day, this is not the stuff that your average consumer is buying. And guess what? Your average consumer is who makes up the majority of the market. It's everyday people who are wearing everyday clothes. So I would really focus on creating designs that are commercially viable. So what does this mean? It means looking at brands that you're interested in and looking what they are actually selling in the retail market, whether this be direct to consumer where they're selling directly on their website and the customer's going to their website to purchase, or whether they have a retail shop or whether they're selling at another retail store. But what types of stuff do you actually see on the rack, whether it's the online rack or the physical rack in real life that are being sold in the market? These are the things that you're going to want to design. Now, you can do the fun, conceptual, super artistic work for fun. And and if that is how you get your creative outlet out, then I really applaud that. And you can do that. But in your portfolio, the things that you have to show, the things that you have to communicate to a brand is that you know how to design commercially viable product because this is, at the end of the day, what sells. They do not make money off of these, you know, really conceptual artistic pieces you see on the runway. So that's where I would focus on design is Are these everyday products that the everyday person would buy that this is realistically viable going to go into the market and someone is going to consume? All right, Mary, I hope that helps on some other skills you can focus on besides Illustrator and Tech Packs. Please keep me updated and let me know how everything continues to progress for you. All right, next up, we have a question from Noah. And Noah says, I graduated from FIT and majored in accessories design. I've since interned at a few places, but now that I'm looking for a permanent job in the industry, I can't seem to land one. I'm getting interviews, so I know my resume isn't the issue. I have a portfolio, and I looked at your website to only use job relevant designs, yet I'm missing something, obviously. I've used the websites for fashion, recruiters, and nothing seems to work. 
I would advise I was advised by my school not to have an online portfolio since people are more likely to steal ideas that way. I'm hoping you can help me in any way by giving me direction or looking at my portfolio. All right, Noah. Here's the thing. First of all, I want to address a couple things that you've said in your your email to me here. Um, your school advised you not to have an online portfolio since people are more likely to steal ideas that way. I am going to say this is a terrible advice. Um, if you've read my ultimate guide to portfolios, which I will link to in the show notes, you cannot be so worried about people stealing your ideas. Listen, your product gets put on the internet. Designs get put on the internet. People knock stuff off all day long. You are never going to prevent ideas from getting knocked off. Stop worrying about this, you guys. It just it causes you more stress and does you more harm than good. Now, do you need a website portfolio? Well, I talk about this very extensively in my book on portfolios. Again, I'll link to that in the show notes. If you guys haven't read it, please read it. I answer all of these questions in that book. And you don't need a website. I often think that a website is a huge hurdle for a lot of designers, and that's why they get so hung up on their portfolio. I personally advise doing your portfolio as a PDF, but the reason is not because people are going to steal your designs, but because building a website can feel very daunting and overwhelming. So... Do not let the reason that you don't build a website be because you think people are going to steal your ideas. I'm sorry, but whoever at FIT is telling you that, it's terrible advice. Um, Beyond that, you are getting interviews, so you know your resume isn't the issue. That's fantastic. And then you're not getting the job. So, again, and I emailed you this, no, and I told you to read the book on portfolios. So I don't know if you'll have read it by the time I answer the question on the podcast here, but I talk specifically about this in the book. And here's the advice. When someone tells you no, when someone doesn't give you the answer you want, when someone doesn't give you the opportunity that you want, meaning they don't offer you the job, they don't offer you the internship, you ask for a pay raise, they don't ask, they don't give you the pay raise, whatever it is, whenever you ask for something and you don't get it, you have to ask why. And I know this can feel so painful. It can be so uncomfortable to ask someone, why didn't I get the job? Can you give me some feedback why I didn't get the job? This can feel very, very uncomfortable, but what it will do is it will allow you to figure out where there are holes in your portfolio, where there are holes in your experience, where there are holes in whatever. Maybe it was your interview. Um, And that can help you figure out what you need to work on. There's so many variables that go into it. You could be your interview. It could be um, some way that you're coming across. I don't know. I'm not interviewing you. I haven't had these conversations. I haven't seen your portfolio. But there could be a lot of reasons. So here's how you ask for the feedback. You can do it in a very, very constructive way. I wouldn't just say, why didn't I get the job? Can you give me feedback why I didn't get the job? I would ask two to three very specific questions. And I would just say, you know, I would love to get some feedback from you. It would really help me make some any necessary adjustments so that the next time I have an opportunity, hopefully I can land the job. Would you let me know what was it about my portfolio or about the interview that that caused you that 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 made you not give me the job that, um, you know, you can play with the wording a little bit there. I, I think I've got some direct quotes of how you can ask these questions in my book, but you've got to ask them. Now, are you going to hear back from all of them? No, you're not. Some people are just not going to even have the time to reply and give you the feedback, but some people will, because here's the thing. Most people don't ask for the feedback. And if you do, a lot of people are very happy to give it. Now, you may get like a generic answer like, oh, we went with a more qualified candidate, and that's fine. I think that's sort of a blanket statement. But I would probe on that. I would ask even more. Thank you so much. Is, do you have any suggestions on how I could you know, gain some more experience or become more qualified or do a more self-directed project so that the next time I do have an opportunity like this, I could land the job? Or do you have any ideas of what else I could have included in my portfolio or things I could have done differently in the interview to have landed the job? If you push people 
in a nice sort of assertive way, you know, don't get overly aggressive. But if someone were to come to me, uh, because I've interviewed and I've hired people, if someone were to come to me and really ask for constructive critique as to why they didn't get the job, I would give it to them. And then what you need to do is you need to take that. It may be really hard to hear the feedback, but take it, implement it, and I guarantee you that with time, you will make adjustments that will then lead you to stand out and be the candidate that gets the job. So ask for that constructive feedback. It's going to be hard to hear. Take it and improve on what you're doing. All right, Noah, please do keep me updated on how this pans out for you. I'd love to hear what happens with this and what feedback you get and what adjustments you're able to make. And uh, let me know when you land that first gig in the industry. I know you're going to get there. All right, next up, we have a question from Austin. And Austin says, I have my first design client on the line. Congratulations, Austin. I'm super excited for you. But I'm lacking confidence in formatting designs and how to present questions without letting them know that I don't really know the drill. All right, so Austin, you're a little bit new to the game. That's okay, but that's great that you're reaching out to get some support. Austin says, I want to see some of their other designs to get a feel for how they are accustomed to seeing things presented. Is it common practice to ask my contact at the brand to pass them along to me? Absolutely. I love this question. And coming from a perspective of having hired people, having hired freelancers to help with design on projects, if someone asks me for some examples to see how I like things put together, I am thrilled to share examples with them. It means that they're paying attention and they care to do a really good job and to make sure to do things in a way that I like and that I'm used to. So not only is it appropriate to ask this question, I think it's really going to let you shine in an amazing light in the brand's eyes. So you can say something really simple like, I'd love to see some samples of how you've put this together in the past so I can make sure to stay in line with what you're used to. Could you send me some references? And if there's anything you love or anything you want changed about this that you don't like, let me know so I can make sure to keep the things you like and make improvements where possible. Oh my gosh, you're going to blow me out of the water because not only now are you asking for references so that you can make sure to stay in line with what I expect, but you're also asking me what I love about it and what I don't like about it so that you can help make sure the good things stay good and that you can have opportunity to improve the things that I don't like. Brilliant. So simple, but I guarantee you the brand will not only be impressed with you asking this, but it's going to let you do a better job and serve them better and everybody's going to be happier. So go ahead with that. Let me know how it goes. Please do email me and update me. I would love to hear how that works out for you with your first client. And again, congratulations. I am so, so excited for you. All right, the last question we have today is from Rhea. And Rhea says, I've managed to find a few suppliers that I have visited their factories before. I've sent them my designs and have asked them to quote, quote me. All of them, perhaps, knew my inexperience in the field and they quoted me a very high price for samples and bulk production. Except one supplier who was rated quite well on Alibaba, but I have never seen their factory before. I just happened to reply to one of their emails and they quoted me with reasonable prices for my designs. The problem is I want top-notch quality stitching. Should I be cautious that they are quoting me much lower than the rest? What would you do in my position? All right, Rhea. So I think that there is a fine line between getting quoted really high and someone ripping you off and getting quoted really high because they're going to do an exceptional job. They may, Their factories may be located somewhere where labor costs are higher. Maybe their MOQ, their minimum order quantity, the amount that you actually have to order is lower. Maybe they have a faster turnaround in the lead time. So there's a lot of variables to look at when you look at pricing from factories. Um, Another variable that I always look at with my clients is what are the payment terms? You know, some factories will do payment terms of, you know, 30% down payment, 30% upon completion of production, and 30, 30%, 33%, one third, uh, on one third payment on receipt of product. Some factories give brands, you know, net 30 or net 60 or net 90 terms, and that can adjust the price. My guess is that that's not a space that you're in based on just starting out. I don't think factories are going to be giving you net 30 or net 60 or net 90 terms. 
But the point is that there's a lot of variables that go into figuring out what the price is. And so I don't think it's just looking at the stitching quality. Now, yes, you want good stitching quality. And yes, that's important for your brand and your product. So weighing all the other variables as well, I would do a a big price comparison and see what you're really looking at. Beyond that, you said you have this one from Alibaba that came in with a really low price and they have good reviews on Alibaba, but you're cautious because they are quoting you really low. So first of all, well, what are their minimum quantities? It could be because their minimum quantities are really high. You know, again, where are they located in relation to where these other factories are located? Because you said you're able to visit these other factories. You're not able to visit the factory on Alibaba. So this could be a difference of looking at a factory in the U.S. or looking at a factory in the U.K. versus looking at a factory in China or India. Those are going to be very different prices. Now, can you get really good stitching quality from a factory in China or India or somewhere overseas, somewhere non-domestic. Yes, you absolutely can. But the thing that you really have to look at is what works best for you. Looking at, at minimums, you know, I don't think it's very smart to order more product just because you can get a better price. I think it's better to start small, even if that mean, means paying for paying more. But let's go back to the stitching quality and if you should be cautious about their price. Here's what I always would do. I would always ask for a basic sample that they can sew up for you. And if you need to pay a small fee for that, then you need to pay a small fee for that. And I would ask for that from, let's say, three different factories that you've talked to with different price ranges. Because here's the thing. I have gotten quotes from factories who The quotes come in super, super low and competitive, and they say they do all this great work, and they tell me all these brands they've worked for, and everything sounds amazing, and I ask them for a sample, and it comes in horrendous. The stitching quality is a hot mess. Immediately, I know, yeah, guess what? They can do this for really cheap, but it's really junky, and that's not a product that is going to work for my customer, uh, my clients, my freelance clients. So you, there's nothing that words can tell you in terms of how good the stitching quality is going to be and how good the sample process uh, product is going to be constructed. You're going to have to see something in real life. And the other thing that you're going to want to think about when you're going through the sample process is what is it like with each of the factories? You know, how quickly do they respond to your emails? How quickly do they get the the sample done and send it to you? How easy or difficult are they to work with? These are all things that you should think about when you're first talking to a factory. These are all red flags. If a factory is slow to respond and slow to deliver on an initial sample request trying to get your business, then that is a huge red flag that that problem is only going to get worse. So you really need to go through the process to just get a basic sample from each of these factories it doesn't have to, you know, be your exact fit or your exact design. You know, maybe you give them a picture of something and you just say, can you make something similar to this? I would really like to test the sewing and construction quality. You know, here's roughly what the fabric specs are and give them each the opportunity to make that. Again, are you going to have to pay for maybe three different samples? You are, but that's cost of doing business and that's a small investment to make to make sure that the product is made right when you do make that dive into deciding who is going to do your bulk production. So if I were in your position, that's exactly what I would do. And then from there, your gut, as well as how the sample comes in, is going to tell you exactly which factory to work with and which is not the best option. And you may be surprised. It could be the lower price factory. You just don't know. But that's how you need to go about this in a smart, methodical way to make sure that you don't make any mistakes and you don't get yourself into a situation where your product is not what you want it to be. All right, Rhea, let me know how that goes. Please do keep me updated and email me anytime to share how your testing with those factories goes. I would love to hear from you. All right, you guys, thank you so much for listening. I appreciate each and every one of you so much. This was another mailbag episode for the podcast. If you have questions that you want answered on the show, no matter how silly or small or big they may seem, Even if you feel like it's a dumb question, don't be shy to reach out. There's no such thing as a dumb question. Everybody starts somewhere and everybody has questions. And chances are there's a lot of other people out there that have the same questions that that want answers. So email me anytime at podcast at soheidi.com. 
And again, if you'd like to learn more about any of the resources I mentioned in this episode, either scroll down where you're listening on iTunes or on your phone, or visit the show notes at sfdnetwork.com slash 68. Make sure to subscribe in iTunes so you never miss a episode. And if you enjoy the show, reviews are always welcome. Thanks so much, you guys. I'll talk to you in the next Successful Fashion Designer Podcast episode.